Well, good morning and welcome to church today on May 3-0. It's a new way of counting, apparently, from the emails that we're getting. But we're so glad that you're here with us. If you're online on one of our venues, if you're watching on Kojiko, and thank you to those who are in the building today serving with us. We're just glad that you're here. Um, I have to say, though, that we still miss having you in the building with us, and we're hoping that soon we'll be able to welcome some of you back to meeting with us. Um, so please stay tuned. We will make the announcement in many ways once we know when you're welcome to come back. And we'll uh, go back to our way of registering and, and social distancing and all that kind of thing um, once we are able to, which we're holding out hope, aren't we, Merv, that, that it's soon that we can see you back in the building here. Um, we're going to continue our sermon series today on imitating Jesus. And I have to say that working in the office here, I get sneak peeks of what's coming on Sunday mornings. And Merv will come out, sit on my desk and say, what do you think about this? Or sometimes he asks me questions and I think, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> um, but I've been enjoying this series and I hope you have too. We have a little game that we've been doing with this series and uh, we've taken it from our sermon bumper. And so we're gonna play that right now. So on the screen is going to come up somebody from our congregation. And I want you to put in the chat who you think it is once you can figure it out. There is a huge prize for this. Uh, not really, but we're just having fun together. So who do you think that is? Anyone watching the chat in the room? Who? Yep, the room here has got it. Chris is on the ball. That is our lovely friend, Joyce. Joyce today is imitating Jesus. We have a few events coming up. First of all, I want to thank you for those who tuned into our annual general meeting this past week. Uh, we did a first for the church where it was completely online, and it ran pretty smooth, I'd say. I think we did okay with that. Um, it was good to see a bunch of your faces again, and so just thank you for taking the time to uh, invest in our church in that way. We have another event coming up virtually next Sunday. It's called Lunch in Lebanon. And no, we're not flying to Lebanon. Um, but we do have a family, the Botros family, that are currently there serving as missionaries. And they're going to do a Zoom call with us. And they're going to teach us how to make hummus and tabbouleh. I've never made either. I have enjoyed both but I would like to learn how to make them so I can enjoy them more. So it's a free event. You just need to go to our church center app and register. We have room for 24 um, participants. And once you register, um, you will get an email telling you what uh, ingredients that you need to have on hand. And so that's next Sunday at 1 p.m. And I think it'll just be a fun, um, different time. So lunch in Lebanon, but in your own home. Does that make sense? We are also looking at doing some worship gatherings outdoors. I don't know if you were part of them last summer, but we did a couple outdoor things where we did social circles on the lawn and we brought the bands out and it was just a great time um, of worshiping and connecting in a way that was appropriate for the times. Um, so we're bringing those back again this summer. So we're hoping to have one in June. Uh, really hoping that July and August that we can have those. Um, Obviously, we don't know what the restrictions are, but as soon as we do, we'll let you know about those again. And, uh, you know, last year we had a chance that you could order food from a local restaurant and they delivered it and we could support them. And we just had a great time playing and worshiping together. So keep tuned for those. Chaos. Chaos is our junior high program, and its last gathering for this school year is this Wednesday. It's a games night on Zoom, 7.30 as usual. I know last time they met, they did the, um, we taught them how to escape detention, which feels kind of wrong, but I think they had lots of fun, and they had a record number of kids uh, turn out for that. So this Wednesday is the last meeting for that. Now I just want to invite you to worship God with us as we sing, as we pray, and as we learn together. the 
in your name, calling out to you. Wounded glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason. You're the reason we're here. Yep. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens.
Hi kids! Well, we're into the final three on our list of the fruit of the Spirit. We have already covered love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and today we're talking about faithfulness. Now, I have two questions for you to start. The first one is, have you ever been criticized for doing the right thing? The second question is, have you ever stood up for someone who couldn't defend themselves? If you answered yes to either one of those, then you have demonstrated faithfulness. Faithfulness shows up in all kinds of different circumstances. Faithfulness is really standing up for what we believe because it is the right thing to do. Today we're going to have a Bible story about the apostles. And this was after Jesus had gone back to heaven and the apostles were telling everyone the good news about Jesus and what they knew of him. That got them into a little bit of trouble. And so they had a choice to make. And well, let's watch together to see what they decided to do. Stories of the Bible. The Apostles and the High Council. These are the Apostles. Hello. They followed Jesus during his time on earth. See ya. After he went to heaven, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be their helper. Then the Apostles spread the good news about Jesus everywhere they went. The apostles performed many miracles and healed the sick. They met regularly in the temple in Jerusalem, and many came to believe in Jesus. Huh. All this made the Jewish high priest and his officials very jealous, so they arrested the apostles and put them in jail. But an angel of the Lord came in the night Whoa! and opened the gate of the jail. The angel told them to go to the temple and tell people about Jesus. Got it. So at daybreak, the apostles went to the temple and told people about Jesus as the angel told them to. Meanwhile, the high priest and his officials called together a meeting of the high council. They sent the guards to bring the apostles out of jail, but when they went to the jail, they were gone. Wait, what? They returned to the council and reported that the men were gone. Guess what? Then someone arrived and announced that the men who were in jail were standing in the temple, teaching people. Go get them! The captain went with his temple guards and arrested the apostles. Come on, you. They brought them before the high council. The high priest said, We gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name. Um, yeah, but... But Peter and the apostle said, We must obey God rather than any human authority. They told Jesus' story that he was raised from the dead after they hung him on the cross and that now he was in heaven. They told them that Jesus did all these things so that people of Israel would turn to God and be forgiven for their sins. This made the high council furious, <laughs> and they decided to kill the apostles. But one Pharisee named Gamaliel stood up <clears throat> and ordered that the men be sent outside the council for a while. Then he warned his fellow Jewish leaders that killing the apostles might bring more trouble than good. He advised them to leave the apostles alone. Not a good point. The other Pharisees saw his point and accepted his advice. They called the apostles in and had them beat up, but they didn't kill them. They ordered them to never speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. The apostles left the high council happy that God thought them worthy to suffer for preaching the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they continue to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah.
Well, there you saw it. The disciples continued to be faithful in telling others about Jesus, even though there could have been some pretty big consequences for them. It likely helped that an angel reminded them that it was the right thing to do, to be telling the good news to everyone. The Bible tells us as well to be people who tell the good news. We're supposed to tell our neighbors and our friends the good news about Jesus. And by doing that, we show that we are being faithful. I have two questions for you as we finish today. The first one is, has there ever been a time when you chose to be silent rather than telling about Jesus or doing the right thing? And the second question is, how can you plan to speak up and do the right thing in the future? I'll give you a little hint. Praying can be really helpful. Remembering how much Jesus went through, that we have something amazing to share with others, and that everyone wants to know that they are loved by God. So this week, let's show faithfulness. It tastes so good. Love would be a strawberry. Joy would be a peach. Peace would be a pineapple. Patience would be a purple plum. I would put them all together, mix them all around, then serve that sweet salad to everyone Like a fruit salad mm, It tastes so good If the fruit of the spirit Would like a fruit salad mm, It tastes so good Kindness would be a blueberry Goodness would be a grape Faithfulness would be a watermelon Of course without all
Well, good morning, church, and grace and peace to you in Jesus' name. It is uh, good to be together again, um, virtually again for me this time, but uh, before too long, I trust um, we're going to be all together. But anyway, uh, I know that the Lord hears our prayers as we join our hearts together. Uh, I know that he longs to hear them, and I, I believe that he wants to answer prayers that we pray uh, that are according to his will. And I'm trusting that uh, our prayers this morning are going to be just that. So let's go to him together now, shall we, and, and pray. Well, Father, we want to just continue to, um, to come to you in an attitude of praise. And uh, Lord, I, I'm always struck these days when I look around the world and I, I see the magnificence of your creation. Um, whether it's, you know, monstrous mountains or incredible oceans or anything at all and uh, on the macro end of things. And then, Lord, um, when we start to look down into the micro and get uh, drilled deeper and deeper into uh, the makeup of, of our bodies and cells and the way that they, they work, and the communication that you have set up, Lord, that uh, that uses chemistry, uh, we just stand in in awe of you and can declare absolutely with truth that there is no one like the Lord. There is no one like you, Lord. So we come humbly because because of that. But Lord, at the same time, we stand before you because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for us. So we, we approach you with confidence. But Lord, we do come to you acknowledging um, that we are sinners and uh, continue, Lord, you have revealed yourself to us. You have given us the ability to know who you are. And even though that's happened, we continue, Lord, to, uh, to follow in our own paths so, so often. And uh, Lord, I know for me it's, uh, it's difficult and sometimes I give in to the demands of my flesh and I become lazy and maybe a lot of times it's more what I don't do um, than, than what I do. But I trust that because we can bring to you our sins and we all have our own and confess them to you that you are faithful and just to purify us from all unrighteousness. And, and we thank you for that today, Lord. Um, we've had uh, some people, Lord, uh, in our church, and, and it's always like this. There are people, Lord, that, uh, that have great needs. And um, first of all, we want to thank you for Blair and uh, the wonderful news of, of his surgery and uh, the way the doctors were so positive about uh, uh, about the surgery and we just want to uh, first of all thank you for that thank you that it's managed to happen this quickly during a pandemic um, but then also commit him to you the rest of the way and praying that um, that the whole medical team God will just have um, real wisdom and Lord, uh, that he will get the best care. And I pray that you will place your very hand um, on them and on him and that you will heal him to the fullest extent. I want to pray for uh, Ray Mitson, God. He needs your touch on his body to make him whole. I'm thinking of people, Lord, um, many um, that, we, uh, that we know that actually that have shingles or are having the effects uh, of of shingles after uh, even after the virus is gone and uh, and we want to lift them to you Beryl and and others that we know and pray for your comfort Lord and and for wholeness to return to their bodies and all of us God have one or two or maybe more on our minds and even though we can't hear one another I do believe, God, that as our minds and our hearts raise ourselves to you, that you hear those names. And I trust that we all agree with one another 
as we lift these names and we pray, Lord Jesus, uh, heal and, and bring wholeness. Lord, that's, that's what we need. I want to pray for us, God, as a people as well. Um, and uh, it was an interesting teaching that I heard uh, a little while back about how idols are in our lives and that we have them there because they can kind of conceal who we actually are and uh, and and really they become like a facsimile of, of who we are as if we're trying to escape that reality but the reality is this your word has said has said that we have this incomparably great power available to us us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ we have it available to us and I pray for 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 uh, these things God one a revelation for us as a congregation and as individuals Lord where we are blind where we have idols and I pray by the power of the name of Jesus God that you will knock them down and that you will destroy them and I pray God that you will fill us with the spirit of wisdom and revelation that we may know you better and that we may not just have access to but we will access the incomparably great power that you offer to us and Lord that you will see that power being uh, worked out in our lives as we are in our community and we want to say to you together Lord here we are send us I just pray that you will help us God I pray that you will give us the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ as we look out unto the world that we live in and uh, and Lord that we may be ministers on your behalf thank you God for your goodness thank you for um, everything that you have brought us through and what I trust you will continue to bring us through and thank you most of all that because we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ that we trust that you hear us and that you will act so Lord Jesus continue to receive our worship and may we see your power revealed in us as a church and as individuals. Amen and Amen. So good morning, my fellow neighborhood missionaries. I was um, reading a story a while back about a guy named Dennis who, as a result of some poor planning, needed some dry cleaning done the same day. And uh, he uh, decided uh, he needed to find a place, and he found this place, but it was on the other side of the town um, because there is a store that he remembered passing. It said, uh, one hour dry cleaners. Um, and so he thought, I'm going to head there. So he, he went to the other side of town, took the extra time, went out of his way, dropped off his suit, and after filling out the tag, he told the clerk, he said, I need this in an hour. And she said, I, I can't get it back to you until next Thursday. She goes, I, I thought you did, a, you, you did one hour dry cleaning. She goes, no, she replied, that's just the name of the store. Those of us who carry the name Christian but fail to act like Jesus, um, the one with the, whose name we bear, we create confusion and disillusionment, just like that store name did, for those who are kind of looking at us. And perhaps more than any other area where the church seems to fail to reflect the life of Jesus, especially in North America, is in the area of supernatural power that Christians claim to access because the presence of the Spirit of God living in them. 
a spirit they claim fills them with the virtues of patience and self-control and unconditional love, and also the power of God is present to them to see and experience the miraculous. But throughout history, uh, there have been movements and people who have leaned into this power from on high. The story is told of uh, St. Francis, who lived from 1182 to 1226, uh, who once encountered a blind girl from the city of Bagda uh, in the uh, Spoleto Valley. And seeing her inward heart devotion, he marked the eyes of the blind girl with his spittle three times in the name of the Trinity and restored to her the sight that she desired. One man from the city of Orte had a tumor between his shoulders the size of a large loaf of bread, and Francis, seeing his condition, lay hands on him and blessed him, and he was suddenly so completely cured that there is no trace of our tumor that remained. The spirit-filled life is about giving evidence of that supernatural encounter, both in our manner as we exercise the fruit of the Spirit, and in our means as we exercise the power of the Spirit. And if we look at the life of Jesus for any length of time, it becomes quickly evident that he was a man who was constantly being led by the Spirit and empowered by the Spirit of God. After his baptism, we read that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And as you remember, it was there that he was tempted by Satan. And then the scripture goes on to say that after the temptation, he returned to Galilee filled with the power of the Spirit. Jesus was constantly performing signs, discerning thoughts, speaking with authority as one who was in touch with the Spirit of God. And the presence of the Spirit of God is the desire of God for all of his children. Now, up to this point, having studied the contemplative tradition of taking time to be still and the holiness tradition of this inward reflection, you may have gotten the impression that the spiritual life of the Christian was passive. But the spirit-filled life brings equilibrium to this misunderstanding. The spirit-filled life is one of motion and fluidity. It is a life of continual filling. When Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit, the verb tense suggests not a one-time activity, but an ongoing reality. It would be more accurate to say, keep on being filled with the Spirit. The New Revised Version translates 2 Corinthians 3.18 this way, all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Do you hear the sense of ongoing, continual feeling, the changing from degree to degree and ever-increasing glory? There is movement to this feeling. In Galatians 5.28, we're told to keep in step with the Spirit. And the impression given is that the Spirit for life is not one of a single experience. And having arrived, it's a continual journey, and we need to keep pace with the Spirit. And I love how Jesus describes the Spirit when he's talking uh, with Nicodemus in John 3. He says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The life that is found in the Spirit of God is a life that's in motion. Wind is never still or it ceases to be. There was a time when you would hear a great deal of talk by people about the second filling of the Spirit. And they would go around asking, do you believe in the second filling of the Spirit? As if when you get filled the second time, you've arrived. The reality is there is not only a second filling, there is third and fourths and fifths. There is always more of God's Spirit available to experience. The Spirit-filled life is one of continually being filled. Or perhaps more accurately, there is always more of you that needs to be filled. And the Spirit-filled life is about constantly being filled. Friends, I will tell you the secret of becoming filled with the Spirit for the second, third, or fourth time. It's really no secret at all. Jesus reveals it in Luke 11:9. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. 
Which of you fathers, if, you, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? By the way, those verbs, once more, imply a continuing ongoing action and could be translated, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And that continual asking of God will result in a continual filling from God. Now, let me say that the primary evidence for having been filled by the Spirit of God is not a feeling or an emotion, while those, both of those may have happened, um, but they may not. The primary evidence are an increase in the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Those attributes described in Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that Sherry has been walking through and exploring with the kids. An increase also of the gifts of God's Spirit working through you, evidenced by others um, seeing those gifts in you. And an increase in the presence of God that bears support through opportunities to share about your faith with others as your life invokes curiosity. I wonder if there is some uh, who are feeling empty, and, and you, uh, you're wondering... Uh, You've not wandered from God, but you're just not as enthused about your faith. I wonder if there are some who are weary, um, and you felt the call of God to be different, but you've been striving to be different all by yourself. I'm wondering if there are some who need to be filled with the Spirit of God so that His joy and His power and His glory are evidenced in you. Friends, if that's you, ask, and keep asking until you get an answer. Well, you may say, I had the second experience of God, of the filling, and I even spoke in tongues and, and some, had some other amazing experience. That is great. But there is always more of the Spirit of God to be had. Ask and keep on asking, and God will fill you with His Spirit. Not only is the Spirit-filled life one of continual filling, it's also one of continually discerning. In John 16, Jesus is telling his disciples about this gift of the Spirit. He goes on uh, that he's going to send, and he says this, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. One of the primary jobs of the Spirit of God in our lives is to teach us things and reveal things to us from God. And for us to hear and understand what the Spirit is saying will require ongoing discernment on our part. But I want you to note this. Jesus also had to discern. I love the verse in Luke 5, 17, where it says, One day, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law, who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Jesus discerned the Spirit present. You see, Jesus was dependent upon the Spirit to heal, and he could only heal when the Spirit was present to do so. That's why in Mark 6, 5, we read about Jesus. He could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed by their lack of faith. Have you ever noticed how many different ways Jesus was called upon to heal people? Sometimes he just spoke to them. Other times he laid hands on them. One time he made mud with spit. And sometimes he told people, just go and have a bath. Did you ever wonder how he knew what should be done? I think it's because he lived a life of constant discernment. You see, God will not be kept in our cookie-cutter image. The Spirit is like the wind. He's too creative to be boxed in. How did Elijah know to pour water on the sacrifices on Mount Carmel in front of the prophets of Baal before he set them on fire? How did Elijah know to lie on top of the boy who had died in order to restore life to him? How did Peter know that the man at the temple had faith to be healed when he commanded him to stand up and walk. Friends, how do you know when it's God telling you to do something by his spirit or only your own imagination? Friends, a spirit-filled life is a life of continual discernment, and you have to be willing sometimes to get it wrong. 
Do you remember that uh, time that Jesus uh, was sent some messengers ahead of him to Samaria to get things ready for him? And we read this. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading from, for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned to them and rebuked them. (laughs) James and John had not discerned correctly. Or when the disciples tried to cast out a demon out of a child and they couldn't do it, they had discerned incorrectly. They thought this was the kind of demon that comes out with a command, and Jesus said, no, this is another kind, the kind that comes out only by prayer. Friends, it's been my experience that discernment is often trial and error, but it's also been my experience that God is very patient, and it is his will that we learn. Now, that's not to say that uh, there are not principles that will help us to discern. Um, For instance, when uh, God will never lead us to contradict his word, that's why it's important to know the word. But very often, we will sense something, and we'll just need to act on it. Uh, When there is an impression that comes to mind, I should call so-and-so, or I should pray for that person, or I should go to such and such a place, and you won't find any specific verse in the Bible uh, that's going to tell you if that's true or not. You just discern the best you can, and then you test that leading. And sometimes you won't find the results until later, not until you're in heaven. I remember when I was with Operation Mobilization, the mission agency, and they have a, a, um, a large country gathering uh, in Germany where all the field leaders from all around the world come and gather. And uh, I was at this meeting, and there was two uh, guys who had just met talking, and, and uh, the one was a country leader in, um, uh, somewhere in, in Europe. I forget now the exact place, uh, but it was a communist Europe uh, at one point. And the other fellow said, oh, I did a summer mission trip with OM there. Uh, And he says, oh, when was that? And he told him the year. He says, oh, I wasn't even saved then. Uh, And he said, I was in jail at that time. And the guy says, oh, I got put in jail when I was with OM for distributing Bibles. Oh, he says, that's interesting. What what jail was that? The guy told him the jail. He says, that's the jail where I was put in prison for having my life of crime. And he says, when were you in? And so he told him, he says, I would have been in jail at that time. He says, he says, oh, he said, uh, he said um, tell me about your experience there. You know, and they were trying to find, he says, yeah, he says, it was the weirdest thing. I was only in there for about a week, but on the first night I got put in, I really sensed God telling me to sing. And he said, the last thing I wanted to do was sing, but I just, I, this impression was on me. So I just started to worship God. And I was singing and through the jail. And the guy looked at him and says, that was you? And he says, when I heard Someone singing in a jail that I was in. He says, if somebody can worship God in this jail, that's a God worth knowing. He says, I began to search for God because of your singing. That's how I became a Christian. That's why I serve on a whim. And this guy who had been in that jail for only a week, who sensed this impression, who did not feel like singing, was used of God in ways he had no idea he was being used of. Friends, take the risk. Take the risk. I'm wondering if it's possible that God has been speaking to you about something. He's been impressing something on your mind. It keeps coming back to you, and you just keep dismissing it. Think about it for a second. Some person, you're impressed with some emotion, and, and perhaps God wants you to act on something. And even though you've quickly dismissed it, um, maybe it's time to discern, God, is this from you, and how should I act on it? And to recognize that maybe the Spirit of God is trying to get your attention. And that when we don't discern, we prevent God and His Spirit from working in and through us. There are times when this has happened to me when I haven't discerned. I remember I was on a subway in Toronto. This was when I was in Bible college. And um, I didn't particularly enjoy taking the subway. There was a lot of sketchy people on there. And I remember going into the subway car. And uh, there was this one other guy there. And he sat right across from me and I was sitting there and he was staring at me like blatantly um, unashamedly just staring straight at me and I'm trying not to look back at him because I didn't want to get eye contact and uh, he was just really weirding me out eventually I got to my stop and I went out and I went up to the platform where I was going to catch my bus and I felt a tap on my shoulders I turned around there's this guy and he said there's something different about you what it is it Now, you would think that I would discern this is the Spirit of God giving me an opportunity to bear witness. I did not. I said, there's nothing different about me, nothing. Leave me alone. 
I often wonder if that person had been an angel. I have no idea what God might have been doing at that time, but I know this, I don't think I discerned properly. And it may be that you have your own stories about missed opportunities. You may need to tell the Holy Spirit that you're sorry that you blew it, and then ask Him again to keep revealing things to you. It may be that something has come into your mind even now that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about. Listen, discern, obey. Living a response to the Holy Spirit is part of what the Christian life is all about. And that's why, friends, the spiritual life is also a life filled with continual risk. I wonder if that's why so many of those people who claim to be Christians show so little of the supernatural power of God in their lives. Maybe this is why we're not finding ourselves continually filled from glory to glory, because we do not walk faithfully in the presence and power of the Spirit we have experienced because we're too afraid to take a risk, and so there's no need to fill us with more. I remember as a child uh, getting my food at supper time when I was really hungry. And so when the food was put on my, on my plate, I'd ask for more. And my mother would say, not until you've eaten what's already on your plate. And there's a sense in which we want more of God's spirit, but we aren't even being faithful in obedience to what we've received from him. And quite often, God does not provide what we need until we're in position of having already needing it. You see, it may be that you're asking to do something that's, you're being asked to do something that's outside your comfort zone, like lead some new venture. And even though we feel a strange tug in our hearts that makes us feel that we should say yes, quite often we think to ourselves, I can't lead, I don't have the gift, and so we say no. But the reality is, we don't need that gift until we've said yes. Friends, as long as we do only those things which fit within our areas of competence, and act out of our strengths, we will never be in a place in which we are dependent upon the Spirit and His supernatural power in us. Your comfort with a situation is not the best indicator of God's will. I want to say that again. Your comfort in a situation is not the best indicator of God's will. It may be that you're thinking to yourself, I don't want to be made a fool of. If I get this wrong, I'm going to look like an idiot. Friends, do you know what the Bible says about that? It says this, God humbles the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. If you're not sure, but you want to test an impression in obedience to God, then tell him. Tell him about your pride that doesn't want to look foolish. (laughs) He cares about you. He's gentle and meek, and you can trust him. But you say, I'm just too afraid. Tell him. God has not given you a spirit of fear, the Bible says. Share what you sense with another who can walk with you in obedience. Friends, I'm just wondering if God longs to do more through us than we allow because we're depending too much on our own strength, our own power, our own wisdom, our own abilities. And God wants to do more if only we take a risk of obedience. I recently received a ministry update from Operation Mobilization um, in Nepal. For, for last year, and listen to the report of what's happening there. In October, one of our teams working in the west of the country gave books to local believers and encouraged them to share with their neighbors. After prayer and fasting, BJ, one of those sent out, met his own relatives and others he knew, including Callie, a widow. Callie was blind and could not see anything despite having seen many doctors in Nepal and India who were not able to find the source of her blindness. She was told there was nothing they could do. Callie was saddened by this reality, and she decided to turn to Hindu priests for help. After visiting many temples for the worship of idols at significant personal expense, there was still no improvement to her sight. Discouraged, discouragement set in for Callie. It was after this that BJ appeared on the scene. BJ met Callie and shared about Jesus and the power he had to heal sickness, forgive sins, and give eternal life. BJ gave Callie an SD memory card full of the gospel content and the phone number of one of the workers named Pradeep, who had sent him out. Just a few days later, Callie phoned Pradeep and invited him to her home where she put her faith in Jesus. Pradeep and those with him taught Callie to pray. They also placed their hands on her eyes and prayed. Immediately, Callie could see. Callie declared, this God is the true and powerful God. And the whole village came to hear of the miracle resulting in seven others believing in Jesus. 
These days, Callie enjoys sharing her story of how Jesus healed her. Friends, this wasn't hundreds of years ago. This was last year. Friends, the charismatic tradition of the spirit-filled life is also God's will for us. And I think it works well with the other two that we've looked at. The, when we quiet ourselves before God in our contemplative, prayer-filled life, and he speaks to us, and we grow more familiar with his voice, and as uh, we examine our heart and re- invite him to remove, remove the sludge of sin that so quickly deposits there through the virtue-filled life, then, friends, there's, once that sin's being removed, there's more room for the, the Spirit of God to fill us deeply. And uh, there's no doubt that he will speak to us about those things that burden his heart so that we can do through him in us, by his power, work in us great things. We were created to live our lives in cooperation with the Spirit of God. He did not save us and then send us on our way to do the best that we can. He saved us to fill us and to go with us and to lead us into doing better than we can do by our own power. So how can we nurture the spirit-filled life? Allow me to offer these suggestions. The Bible is clear that all followers have been given uh, and gifted with the Spirit of God. And while we, we may think of the spiritual gifts as those more supernatural abilities like prophecy or speaking in tongues or healing, um, the Bible speaks about gifts like leadership and helping and mercy, and encouragement, and to grow in the Spirit-filled life, simply exercise the gifts that you've been given. The Spirit will enable you to do more uh, than what natural abilities and talents can do. So don't be afraid to offer yourselves in doing what God has gifted you to do. Now, I know that we often think, but my gifts aren't that special. Thomas Tewell, a pastor at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church, New York, tells the following story. My friend Andy Eddington, once the uh, president of Shriner College in Texas, would go to prisons and preach to men on death row in Huntsville, Texas. I used to go with Andy every now and then, and on one of those trips, we stopped at a greasy spoon on our way home to Dallas. Andy loves sugar in his coffee, so he took not one, not two, but three teaspoons of sugar. As the waitress watched, Andy said, ma'am, we're going to need more sugar at this table. The Texas waitress looked at Andy and said, Listen, bud, before I give you more sugar, you stir what you got. Now there is a sermon there, he said, and the sermon is stir what you got. Use your gifts. Someone who won't use a lesser gift will never use a greater gift because our usefulness is not about our gifts. It's about our hearts. Second, don't be afraid to step out and act on your hunches. If you have prayed and done your best to discern if the Spirit is leading, Take a chance. If you feel God wants you to pray for someone, offer to pray. If he puts a word in your heart that you believe is for another person, offer it to them as a gift. Allow them to discern if it's true word from God or not. In 1 Corinthians 13, 9, it says, we know in part and we prophesy in part. I take that to mean that there is an aspect of risk to sharing what we think the Spirit might be saying. Absolute certainty is not promised. Third, Invite others you trust to help you test and discern what you think the Spirit might be saying or where he might be leading. The Christian life is not meant to be lived alone. We need each other. One last thing I'd like to address before the end. There is a tension in many people with regard to the Spirit for life, and it's this. I think the longer we have identified as Christians, the more prone we are to give into the impulse to domesticate God. We forget that Jesus tells us that the Spirit blows where it will. And sometimes we can inadvertently resist him when he attempts to do something different. You see, we want more of God's Spirit, but we want him on our terms. We first want to know what he might do and what he might ask of us. That is not how it works. God has not given his Spirit so that he can help you. Uh, God has not given his Spirit so that he can help you to do what you think is reasonable. He has given you his spirit so that you can do what he thinks is reasonable. There is an inevitable surrendering to God that enables him to do greater things in you, friends. Beware of the tendency to limit where the spirit of God blows. Friends, this is a spirit-filled tradition of the Christian life, walking in obedience to what the spirit of God is saying. This week, let's lean in 
to what Spirit of God is doing and trust that He might use us in ways we never anticipated. Let us pray. And so, Father, we pray that we might grow more sensitive to your Spirit, recognizing that as your Spirit impresses our hearts, it requires from us that we act. And so give us, first of all, the discernment to recognize your voice. Give us the will to be able to act upon it and the courage to follow through. And Lord, where we're not sure, the wisdom to pull in others to help us discern properly, knowing that it's, uh, you've given us enough time to discern what it is you call us to. But Lord, we long to see more of your spirit at work, more of the supernatural power of God, more of the fruit of your spirit in our lives as we exercise patience and long-suffering and uh, love that's unconditional to others. Lord, fill us, we pray, for we ask it in your name. Amen. a good, good book, and uh, I think a lot of times we rely on uh, the tangible things like God's revealed word, written word, and um, this whole idea of living by the Spirit, I think sometimes is, is this idea of, it's, if I can use the words, intangible, or it's just the, this journey of relationship with somebody that's maybe um, not so much just on black and white and words and stuff, and I think there's a way of 
like you said in, in the message today, Merv, this way of discerning of the Spirit is such a vital practice that we need to have in our lives. I'm reminded, um, we have, do have a few questions that we'll get to on the chat, and if you do have another question or comment, you can leave it in the chat. We have it right in front of us here. But I'm reminded of um, our journey uh, as a church, connecting with this other church, Wentworth Baptist, and our journey uh, with leadership of discerning the Spirit's uh, leading, and so, Merv, I thought maybe we, you could just discuss a practical thing, because I think a lot of times we make this an individual journey. How does God even use uh, this idea of listening and discerning the Spirit as a community effort? And maybe you can update people on the, the whole Wentworth thing as yeah, well. Sure, yeah. So, um, as you know, we are looking at uh, whether we should uh, graft with uh, Wentworth Baptist Church and uh, the leadership uh, encouraged that we should explore that further, and that's what we were doing prior to COVID. Um, and part of that whole discernment was uh, when we had uh, the whole congregation come together, and if you remember Heather Card led us in an exercise of discerning where we think God might be leading us. And, um, and so we began to begin that exploration, and then COVID hit, and it got put on the back shelf. And part of what led... Um, Wentworth Baptist to explore uh, the possibility of grafting was because of their issue with their building and uh, it needing repairs that was beyond what they could afford and uh, the future looked uncertain. Anyways, uh, if you haven't read in the paper or heard, Wentworth has recently sold its building to Indwell, who's going to create affordable housing. And... Um, uh, and they are also going to revamp and renovate the whole sanctuary area, and they've been given a 30-year free lease of the sanctuary. Um, and in the meanwhile, while it's being renovated, they'll find them an alternative place to worship and uh, cover the cost of that. So it's been a great deal for Wentworth. And because of that, um, uh, crisis averted. The idea of grafting no longer seems relevant, so it's been taken off the table. Um, I would say that's an answer to prayer. I would mm -hmm. say God helped us to discern. Right. Um, and it may not have been what we were anticipating at first, but the circumstances have certainly made it very clear to us that uh, God desires for Wentworth to continue in their neighborhood, um, at that location, independent of us, although we're certainly part of the same um, denomination, part of the same kingdom of God, and so we celebrate what God has done for them, and we're cheering and we're praying for them. Um, but... Uh, that might be a more obvious sign, and, uh, and it's harder sometimes when it's something less obvious. Um, and and uh, the, that's where the risk and the, the, uh, ch the, you know, you just have to take a chance yeah. um, and uh, do the best you can. I've, yeah. I've taken lots of chances and mm -hmm. blown it and looked <laughs> like a fool for Christ. <laughs> Haven't we all? I think uh, this idea of taking risks is... Uh, maybe easy for some of our personalities to uh, to engage in because we're like, oh yeah, let's do this. But um, I understand like the whole process of those two churches coming together was actually a long process. It wasn't just taking a chance or a risk on a whim. It was actually a discerning process that led to that taking of a risk. Yeah. So in some ways, listening to the Spirit is kind of a calculated risk or a let me learn and understand and discern this relationship so that we can move forward. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and I think I think God works with our personalities. Like, it's more likely that someone who's extroverted, like me, uh, God might say, "You need to talk to this guy here now." Then He would to someone who's introverted and takes a long time to process stuff. But that introverted person may be given a word of knowledge about somebody. Hmm. Um, like I often find with my wife. So I haven't asked permission for, from my wife to talk <laughs> about this, but. Honey, forgive me. Um, Again. She, she's more introverted, and, um, and so we can be in a room, and I'm more extroverted. And uh, she will notice the people hanging on the fringes of the crowd who are standing by themselves. And I don't notice those people, <laughs> but she does. And she'll say, hey, that person's standing by themselves. They look lonely. So then I'll just walk up and start talking to them. And I believe that's a, a great use of, of gifts where she's more discerning and uh, able to see people. And then I can use my gift to go and break into conversation um, and make, help make them feel welcome. And then I would introduce them to my wife and bring her in. And, and she can actually carry on conversation better than I can because I'm, I'm pretty surface. And, uh, you know, once we've talked about the Leafs losing, I'm, I haven't got much else to offer. But she's much <laughs> deeper uh, than I am. So, I, but I, and I think the different personalities work 
are meant to work together in that way yeah. uh, of discerning. And, and so um, God uses our personalities um, to do certain things. I mean, it's no, I think it's not coincidental though, that Peter was used to heal that person because Peter is pretty, you know, outgoing, outgoing and, yeah. uh, and he'll, oh yeah, let's try it. You let's know? try it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, two is better than one in most situations. And um, a couple comments on here was, you know, uh, it must make Satan pleased to see how incredibly busy, stressed, and distracted we are, leaving no room to wait, pray, and listen to the Spirit's leading. Do we really recognize busyness as a sin? Mm, yeah, that's, so that's a good point. It's a good point. I yeah. think in our culture we are, uh, you know. And I was also thinking earlier, like our young people, well, even our age people, uh, so... And we'll uh, connect with Sherry on this point too, maybe that social media and on this online thing really pushes us to really make ourselves uh, look good and um, that we have it all together and all this kind of thing. But really discerning the spirit is messy. Mm. And like you said, it, it, we need to take risks and, and be unashamed and be willing to look maybe not all together sometimes and taking ri <laughs> risks uh, for, uh, for the spirit. So... Just before we bring Sherry on, though, because I know she has some comments about that, we were just earlier speaking about two being better than one, and we have some great news today, I think, to oh, share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you want to share I that. I do. Verb. So I don't know if we can swing the camera around. I would embarrass myself. Well, son we actually have much. a picture to show. <laughs> oh, the there's my there. son. <laughs> he uh, proposed to his girlfriend, Natalie, and uh, he is now engaged, and uh, we have a wedding coming up this summer now, and uh, it's, it's made us go crazy. <laughs> he's not, showing, he's not showing his face. <laughs> I don't blame him. <laughs> but uh, So we're very excited for him and Natalie. And uh, I knew last weekend, but I couldn't say anything because they had to tell people. So yeah, big news around our house. <laughs> yeah, so we're excited for Josiah uh, in this uh, new adventure as well. So. Also, just one, I know there's somebody on our street that's anticipating me saying their birthday. Adrian's birthday is today on our street, so happy birthday, Adrian. And uh, so we're going to invite Sherry, uh, our family children's pastor, on with this. And maybe, Sherry, as you come in from the, <laughs> the ceiling there, if you, uh, maybe you can comment a little bit on this whole uh, idea of uh, discernment of the Spirit. I know we talked about the fruit of the Spirit of faithfulness today. Maybe this is in conjunction with just being <laughs> faithful and hearing uh, the God speak. Um, so maybe you can speak to that for us and then maybe let us know some events that are coming up. Yeah, Wayne, I love that you're making that connection, that we're, we're called to be faithful and we don't always get to know the result of it, right? Like the story that Merv told about the guy singing in jail. He must have felt like, like, what kind of an idiot am I? But okay, I'll do it. And, and to not know the result for so long. And you know, even as we reflect on the, the situation with Wentworth, like, I don't know, perhaps, you know, we were a, a beacon of hope to them, right? Like we gave opportunity for them to think that there are possibilities still for them. We don't know what the impact is sometimes of our process or the, the, um, the way that we step out in faith. And yeah, so I, I love that connection, the, the faithfulness and just being able to respond. And yeah, to your point that it means sometimes not looking all together, like that you don't know what's going on. And I, I feel like um, I feel like at MBBC, we do a great job of saying it's about effort. You know, we have a teaching pastor who stands up and Merv says, well, I missed it on this one. And I love that because it's it's about being faithful and God rewards the effort. And we're, we're going to make mistakes sometimes. But to to be able to say, OK, I'm open and I'm ready to do what it is you're calling me to. Mm -hmm. And our kids, yeah, like Facebook and social media, we, we do wanna look like we have it all together. So it's really flies in the face of being authentic, which is one of our values. To be authentic means to be like, to be human. And that sort of implies we make mistakes and we mess up, right? And and so we don't wanna show that too often, but but it gives us an opportunity to accept each other and to love each other truly and deeply. and with all the, the bumps and warts that we all that we all have. So anyway, yeah. I could preach my own sermon on this apparently, <laughs> but I will I just loved I, I I'm really enjoying this series of Christ. Can, yeah. can I just jump in yeah, too? For sure. Um what I I haven't said this in a long time, but I, I often tell other groups, so I want to remind us that when it comes to um, uh, obedience and walking with the spirit, attempts count. It, we often, you know, in, in Western and North America, we, we tend to think, oh, success counts. 
and it's only the success stories we tell. But God, God, in God's economy, the attempts count. And so we make an attempt, and we don't always see the results, and we think, oh, I guess I must have got it wrong. But, but God's looking at the heart, and he sings the attempt. And I, when I was a kid, and I stood up to walk, and I fell, my parents would go, loser, come on. They, <laughs> they, they clapped, and they applauded the, the attempt, because we learn from our failings as much as we learn from our successes, probably more of them from our successes. And God is trying to teach us to walk in the Spirit, and it's going to take us falling and failing in order to get better at it. And so when he sees us make an attempt, he's applauding us. And he's like, good, way to go. That was great. Way to go. And that's why we tell God stories when we gather on Sundays, to tell of the attempts where we've tried to be faithful to God, whether or not we saw success in the eyes of the world or what we deem as successful, whether it worked as we sometimes tend to think about it working. Um, it, it's all about us trying to be sensitive to and obedient to the Spirit of God. And sometimes... We are successful, even though we may not see it in that moment, like that guy I talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's things that God is doing um, that we just can't imagine simply because we're making those attempts to be faithful. It's so true. And if there's any generation that really needs to see a, a body of believers imitating Jesus and walking with the Spirit, it's this one. And I think we want to do that for this next generation. So maybe, Sherry, you can let us know some of the events that are coming up um in the area of children and family ministries sure well it was mentioned in the announcements we have our last youth meeting for uh the, the regular wednesday night chaos coming up on wednesday and then i'm busily working with summer students figuring out the summer camps so we're planning to do five summer camps they will be in-person camps just kept really small and following all the guidelines that we're uh, required to do with the government. So I can announce we've gonna, we're gonna have a dance camp and an art camp, and then there's gonna be some other exciting themes, but looking forward to getting word out now. It's, uh, it's kind of late now, but I think people are still looking for what to be doing this summer. So if you, there's not gonna be a lot of spots, but if there's um, people that you know, neighbors, uh, you can let them know that NBBC will be having five day camps this coming summer. That's great. So those day camps are week long, I'm assuming, right? Same, similar to a lot of other weeks. So we have five weeks of camps uh, coming up and we'll be letting you know more of the details on uh, emails and such as we get them. That's great. Um, yeah, I think the, any other events? I know you, you just mentioned the chaos one. I think everything else will resume obviously in the fall and we're obviously all looking forward to a summer of maybe <laughs> reconnecting a little bit more maybe with some worship gatherings as Michelle mentioned earlier and don't forget also the event with the Batras family our partners in mission is next Sunday at 1 p.m. and you can register on our MBBC app as well as our website I noticed it wasn't on the website this morning but I will get that on there this afternoon so you can register for that we only have a limited number for that event as well so make sure that if you're interested in learning how to make tabbouleh and hummus uh, with the Batras family that um, you sign up today for that. And I think if there's no other comments... Just, uh, uh, just a reminder that um, on, for each of these um, sermon oh, yes. topics, we are putting a list of action items on MBBC Acts. Uh, it's the things that I mentioned during my sermon, the things that you can do to kind of uh, encourage and nurture those different virtues and... and uh, ways of imitating Jesus in your life. So if, you, uh, if you've if you listened to the sermons and you go, what did he say we should do again? You can always go back to our website, go to MBBC Acts tab, and you'll find the list of things you could do to develop the, the uh, contemplative life or the virtuous life or the spirit-filled life. You'll see a list of things you can do. And uh, honestly, we don't learn simply by getting information. We learn by getting information and then living it out and acting on it. And that's the whole intent of why we do these things. So right. uh, make attempts to act upon what you're learning because that's how you grow as disciples who are followers of Jesus. Yeah. Now, as any good senior pastor can do, he can transition right into his last word seamlessly. So Seam we're going to turn it over to you seamlessly. for the last, <laughs> last word. You know, um, I think... Um, we've embraced a kind of a Hollywoodized understanding of how God works in the spirit of God. Um, and often we think it's this very strong, you know, deep baritone voice speaking to us as if we're on a mountain from high, everything else kind of 
blurs out and we have this one intense vision from God. That's not been my experience. I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. I think the Spirit of God is much more humble than that. I think, I think we're just walking along our day and he speaks to those who are longing to hear him. And so there's these little impressions we get, these um, thoughts that come um, about a person, and we find that they just keep coming up. And I go, yeah, I've thought about that person a few times now. Ah, maybe I should give them a call, we think. Then call them. Um, you know, we see someone, and we pass them on the highway, and, uh, and we notice that they're struggling, and we think, maybe I should stop. Well, maybe you should. Um, Perhaps uh, we hear about somebody in some need, and it touches our hearts, and we go, oh, somebody should help them. Somebody should, <laughs> and maybe it's you. Um, you know, I, I had a, sorry, this is another illustration, but I had a friend uh, who hurt his leg, and I just really sensed God saying, pray for his leg. So I said, listen, would you mind if I pray for the healing for your leg? He says, sure, I'm always open to prayer. So I prayed for his healing. He's not a Christian. Uh, God didn't heal him. And... Uh, I took him out for coffee, and we've continued to be friends. And he said, you know, the strangest thing happened. I had someone come and say, I, I really sense I should pray for your leg. And so I let them pray for my leg. This is in a bookstore. And then he had another person say, I really feel I should pray for your leg. And he prayed. He says, when are these Christians going to stop praying for me, <laughs> he says. But I find it interesting um, that I think God's doing something. I'm not quite sure what, but I think he knows that God must love him to have so many people come and pray for him. And I've continued in relationship with this guy. And I think he's moving closer and closer towards the kingdom uh, very slowly. Um, and I wonder how many of those failures <laughs> where people just said, I'm going to take an attempt, look like a fool, pray for this guy, actually is being used of God in his life. So don't be afraid to take the attempts. This week, God might speak to you in a way that you've never thought he'd be speaking to you. Take the risk. And maybe he's speaking to you now through the word. For some, he may be saying, you know that, that sin that you're failing to acknowledge? Confess it to me. Repent of it. You know that, that, um, that thing that you're doing that I don't approve of? Repent. Stop doing it. Because you're, if you can't obey him in those things, he's, he's not going to lead you to do other things. Obey where the Spirit of God is leading you this week. Take the risk of obedience. Let's share the stories of attempts and celebrate the God who speaks and moves and does great things in and through us this week. Go in the peace and grace of God this week.